Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text chosen for today is our Holy Gospel reading from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Let us stand in honor of the reading of the Holy Gospel lesson. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare a way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear fellow redeemed, to whom the herald of our Lord announces the coming of the King of Kings and encourages us to prepare the way before him. John the baptizer was a very unique person in the scriptures. His birth was miraculous from the standpoint that his mother Elizabeth was barren and both his mother and his father Zachariah were beyond ch childbearing age. But the angel Gabriel came to his father, Zechariah. Gabriel, the angel probably most famous next to Michael, who stands in the presence of God and announced to his father that his wife was going to have a son. Not only that, but long before Gabriel even mentioned this, the Old Testament prophets had prophesied about the coming of the forerunner of the Messiah, the voice of one calling in the desert to make straight the way for the Lord, the one who would come in the power and spirit of Elijah. And John came and was under a Nazarite vow by the command of the angel Gabriel. A Nazarite vow was a vow that people often took in the Old Testament. But John didn't have to take the oath because he was born a Nazarite. He was not supposed to drink alcohol or anything made from grapes, even grape skins or grape seeds, the Bible tells us. He was not to touch the body of a dead person, any dead carcass, not even the body of a dead relative, or he would be defiled. He was supposed to let his hair grow, and a razor was never to come to his head. Couldn't get a haircut. And so this very strange person, John the Baptizer, came to the Jordan River and he was wearing a leather coat, or rather a camel skin coat and a leather belt. He looked like a prophet because he was a prophet. John the Baptizer was actually the last of the Old Testament prophets and the first of the new. He crossed over from the pages of the Old Testament into the New Testament, and he bridged the gap between the two because he not only had the opportunity to say the Messiah is coming, but he had the great privilege of saying the Messiah is here. He was able to point directly to Jesus as he stood on earth and to say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he directed his disciples and all people toward Jesus. Because that was his purpose. He was the forerunner and the herald of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah who was to come. And all of John's ministry, perhaps, is capsulized in the words of the prophet Isaiah that are quoted by St. Luke in our text for today. All people will see the salvation of God. That's what John had come to show the world. The way has already been prepared. 
You know, if you read the beginning of our text once again, it says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Babylon, or, or ba Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the desert. When you read that list, do you recognize the names of those people? Many of them played very important roles in the life of Jesus. Of course, Tiberius Caesar would have died by the time Jesus came into this world, and it was Caesar Augustus who made the decree that everyone should be taxed, and that because of the census, everyone had to return to his hometown, which caused Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. The Bible, or the Bible here mentions Pontius Pilate, the only person uh, besides Jesus uh, and, uh, and the Virgin Mary who are mentioned in the Apostles' Creed, uh, the only people, uh, human beings. And, of course, Pontius Pilate played a very key role. But it's kind of a tangled mess. You see, our text mentions Annas and Caiaphas, who were high priests at the time. They were envious of Jesus. They were the ones who had Jesus arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. But because they couldn't put him to death, they had to first send him to Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea at the time. When Pontius Pilate heard at the trial of Jesus that he was a Galilean, he was delighted because he knew that Herod Antipas, who was the uh, the uh, Tetrarch of Galilee, was in Jerusalem that day for the Passover. So he sent Jesus there to pan him off on Herod. Herod, of course, sent him back to Pilate. But there's even more to this story. Our text also mentions Philip, the brother of Herod. Now, Philip also was a Herod. They were brothers. But Herod Antipas was a man who was married to another woman, and he divorced her. And his brother Philip was married to a woman named Herodias, who divorced him. And then Herod Antipas and Herodias got married. And when John the baptizer heard about it, he went very boldly to Herod Antipas, and he said, this is an adulterous relationship. You are not supposed to marry your brother's wife. Herod became angry with John the baptizer and threw him into prison. But he didn't want to put him to death because the people regarded John the baptizer as a prophet. So he kept him there until his wife, Herodias, and her wicked daughter, Salome, came up with a plan to have John the Baptist beheaded, put to death. Now, why are all of these people mentioned here? Why are we told it was in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar? Because St. Luke is impressing upon us, this is a real historic account. All of these people that are, being, that are mentioned here in this text really lived on this world, in this world, on this planet. And they are not only mentioned in the Bible, they are mentioned in secular literature as well. They were famous people. And Luke, is, Luke, who was a very good historian, is saying, the Bible is not just another book that we read for entertainment. This is God's plan of salvation for the people of this world. This is real history. This really happened. And everything that is here is really true. <clears throat> John the baptizer was a real person, as was the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whose birth he heralded. Yes, John was an extraordinary person. Jesus said of him that there is none born of women greater than John the Baptist, the greatest of all the prophets. And John had a purpose that was foretold even by the prophet Isaiah. I'd like to read you what Isaiah said exactly. He said, A voice of one calling, In the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground will become level, the rugged place is a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
You know, when John went, ba- when John went into the desert region and he was baptizing in the Jordan, along came the Pharisees and the scribes to see what he was doing. They were gawkers. And John turned to them and he said, You brood of vipers, who warned you to, co- to flee from the coming wrath? Now what if the pastor came into the pulpit one morning and just said, You bunch of low-life spiritual losers, what are you even doing here in church? You'd probably be pretty offended. Might never come back. But that's exactly what John did. He said to the Pharisees, Don't come here with your self-righteousness. Don't come here boasting about who you think you are. Don't think God owes you anything other than damnation. Because that's what you deserve. You see, he was calling them to repentance. And he does the same for you and me today. You know, it always frustrated me a little bit when I used to read this text. Prepare the way for the Lord. You know, every valley shall be raised, or every valley shall be raised up, every mountain shall be made low. And I thought, how can I prepare my heart for the Lord? I know that I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. I know that I do cannot by my own volition, by my own strength, by my own works, make my heart right with God. And sometimes we get that idea. Even sometimes when I have given communion to people, they have said, I'm not really prepared because I haven't examined myself yet. And I don't know that they always, and I appreciate that, by the way, because we are to examine ourselves. But I understand that they might not have the right understanding of it. That examining ourselves does not mean that we cleanse ourselves of all sin before we're worthy to take communion. Otherwise, we could never take it. And the same is true with the coming of Christ. When the Bible says that we are to prepare the way for the Lord, to make straight paths in the highway for him, notice that it says every mountain shall be made low. Every valley will be filled in. It's not something we do. It's something God does to us. John the baptizer did the same thing. He came to the Pharisees and he comes to us and he says, you cannot have these mountains of pride and think that you are going to earn something from God by your good works. You are deplorable and the craters in your life show your unworthiness before God. The craters have to be filled in. The mountains have to be leveled. Making straight in the highway for our God is knowing that we have a Savior who made it straight for us. It is Jesus' righteousness that levels the mountains, that fills in the craters. Because only Jesus was worthy to be accepted by God, and he did so in our place. Did it all in our place. Was so, I should say, in our place, and did it in our place. Jesus lived the perfect life we could not live. And because of our guilt, Jesus went to the cross and paid the debt for our sin. And as a result, through faith in Christ, our sins are forgiven. We have peace with God. We are reconciled to our Heavenly Father. John was the voice in the desert that cried out, Prepare the way for the Lord. And the Lord will accomplish this. John the baptizer was not only the greatest of the prophets, but he was faithful to the end, even died for the sake of Jesus in prison, upholding the truth of God's word. But we shouldn't think that John was just a preacher of the law. The Bible says, if we were to go on in the book of Luke, and with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. The word in Greek is the gospel. John came with a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, the Bible says. That is the same thing that the Bible says about Jesus' baptism. On Pentecost, St. Peter told the people, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, for the purpose of being forgiven, is what the Greek says. That is what baptism does. Of course, not everyone who received John's baptism had a complete understanding of who Christ was and what he did. Apollos, for instance, knew the Old Testament very well, but as he was talking about Jesus, he didn't have it quite right. And Priscilla and her husband Aquila, Aquila, 
they took uh, Apollos aside and straightened out his theology. There were also a little group of Ephesian believers that St. Paul met in, uh, in Acts chapter 19. And he asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, well, we didn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit. He said, whose baptism did you receive? And they said, John's. He said, ah, John's was a baptism of repentance. He said, but he was always pointing to Christ. Always pointing to Christ. And then he rebaptized them in the name of Jesus. You see, John was showing his baptism was not an, or I mean rather his ministry was not an end in itself. He was pointing to Christ. And he said of Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. John's disciples were, were envious for John. And they said, well, Jesus, that guy that you baptized in the Jordan, he's baptizing everybody now and everybody's going to him. And John said, yeah, that's the way that it's supposed to be. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one who came to die in our place for our sin to remove our guilt. When John was in prison, he sent messengers to Jesus. Are you the one who was to come? And Jesus performed miracles for John's disciples. He said, go back and tell John what you've seen and heard. I am the Messiah. I fulfill the words of the prophets. And Jesus went on to say, there's John. He's not a reed shaken by the wind. He is not just some fly by night who is wishy-washy. He is the greatest among all people born of women. He said, but then he went on to say, but even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. John himself was a sinner. John himself was not perfect. John would have been the first one to admit it. But John would be the first one to confess, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. The one who came to live for me and to die for me. The one who paths the way to heaven. And in John's time, he was able to say, there he is in flesh and blood. All salvation, or I mean all mankind, will see the salvation of our God. And that's the privilege we have today. We are not like the prophets of old who simply wait and know that God is going to keep his promise, but not see it with our own eyes. In the pages of Scripture, we have fulfilled what John promised, what the, whole, what the prophets of old promised. All of them preached the same message. The Old Testament prophets, John the Baptizer, Jesus Christ, St. Paul. And the message is this, that through faith in Jesus Christ and by his grace alone, our sins are forgiven and we have eternal life. That is what Advent is about, this season of hope. As we look at the blue pyramids and remember that the, sky, the color of the sky is the color of hope. We look to the sky for the second coming of our Lord, just as the shepherds were looking to the sky on Christmas Eve when the angels appeared to them. That is our hope and comfort. Jesus has come. Jesus saved us. He will return. Amen.